Okay, we're back. I mean, we're really back. We're really back today because we examine things here on ThinkTech and especially on America. What's the name of the show? America finding its way. We have a long way to go to find our way. Today, the title is Another Intersection Between COVID and Voting. And, and what, you know, the reference there is that both of them have been completely politicized among certain parts of the population. Yes, we have vaccines. Science has prevailed, at least in some part, um, but we also have people who don't want to take the vaccines. Yes, we have masks. No, you know, there's a lot of people who don't want to take them. It's still politicized. It's really nutcakes, but there you have it. Um, and the voting, of course, the voting is, is so obviously opposed to the, what the founding fathers wanted. The, the voting is so absolutely wrong. You know, let me, let me preface all this with one point of discussion. Is I know a fellow who says, I follow the rule of law. I said, good. Uh, he says, and there are, you know, 40 or 50 states now that have, um, uh, that have campaigns to uh, do voter suppression uh, legislation. And if the Republicans succeed, you know, in getting those laws passed, that's the law. I follow the rule of law, however it gets to be the law. And if a judge makes a ruling and it's wrong, I don't care. That's the law. I follow the rule of law. What do you think of that, Tim? Well, it's, I hate to say it, it's rather immature thinking. I mean, we can extend that kind of thinking to the sports field. Well, I got a bad call, but I'm going to live with it because it's in my favor. And it really comes down to, uh, I, I really think uh, these 200 and some odd uh, new laws that are being passed in 43 different states as really an extension of January 6th. And it's a rejection of our democracy. It's a rejection of, of, the, of the democracy of fairness of the vote. And, and Cynthia, excuse me, Stephanie made reference to, you know, the reconstruction days. You know, guess how many jelly beans are in this jar before you get to vote? Um, we're going back to those days because again, we're, we're kind of in a cold civil war still. And January 6th was a real uh, eye opener to that, that fact. And now all these states are voting in all these crazy uh, restrictive rules about who can vote, how they can vote, and when they can vote. And so well, let's review for a moment what happened in the previous administration. We had gerrymandering, clear. That was a Republican initiative. We had this um, no mail-in balloting across the country. And all those lawsuits, remember those lawsuits? 50, 60 lawsuits across the country. We had all these technical obstacles, the Republicans Republican governors were putting in the way of voting. Um, we had, uh, uh, for example, let's remove all the ballot boxes so it's more difficult for them to get to the polls. Let's limit the number of polls. Let's limit the number of the poll workers. Let's make it harder for them to prove who they are. Uh, let's, uh, you know, uh, clean uh, the ballot, you know, ballot rolls if you haven't been around, if you haven't registered on a repeated basis. Um, and then, of course, there was the intimidation. And that's all before, you know, this election. And so now we have, it didn't take 60 days. Now we have the Republicans trying additional measures and they're winning them in some places. They're going into the states um, and they're putting in bills, uh, what, 254 bills already that we know about. And some of those bills are going to get passed. Um, you know, and, and then they oppose HR 1 on top of that. Uh, now, if HR1 fails, that's the law. Um, and it probably will, I'm sorry to tell you guys, it probably will fail. Mitch McConnell has sworn he's gonna oppose it and all, all the power he has. Um, and you know, if they win in the states and they get these, these uh, anti-voting, suppression voting, racist bills passed, that's the law. I mean, can we tolerate that? What's the, what's the proper approach on that? I mean, for a good, engaged, civic American, don't even talk about party affiliation. Okay, well, I, I guess my answer is I'd like to talk to your friend and say, if you are so committed to the rule of law and you follow the rule of law, then what about President Biden's executive order of election reform that countermands most of those 254 proposed bills? 
what about that rule of law? You have the executive, executive power and the executive orders, uh, which is the rule of law. What about policy? Isn't all law driven by policy? Should be. Often it isn't. Um, you know, but uh, and it should be also driven by uh, debate, debate on the policy. But that's not happening in our Congress either. Yeah. So at this Stephanie, point, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Stephanie, what about morality? Where does morality fit in the rule of law? Um, I, I think that um, we have an assumption that it is all out there for everybody uh, and that everybody has a notion of it that's similar. And let's go back to the founders. Uh, all of that, they took care of a lot of this that could have arisen then, maybe, but um, they restricted who had the vote and who had who was in the game, who was in the governing game, okay? People with property, no women, you know, men, educated men. So, you know, I never thought I'd be interested in our Supreme Court Justice Scalia's originalism. In fact, I had totally rejected it, but it may be that we need to be thinking about getting back to that that list of values. I mean, the, the underpinnings of uh, the Constitution out of the thinking and the beliefs and the values of the time. Um, it, it looks like we're going to have to do some heavy deep diving on this because we're moving towards, with the way you describe it, we possibly are moving towards the West. You know, I've mentioned that before, Dodge City and with no Marshall Dillon, but a lot of guns. So uh, <laughs> you raise an enormous prospect here uh, that, that we need to think about and analyze and uh, remedy if possible, if we can remedy it. Um, if we stay in the majority enough to remedy it, because it's going to get down to that. Yeah. So Winston, we have people, you know, they're kind of Trump stragglers. I guess I do believe that Trump is losing his mojo uh, by simply not being in the public eye. But, you know, we have these stragglers who, who still refuse to wear masks. It's a political statement who don't do social distancing. Governors, you know, who reopen and tell everybody they can do whatever they want, um, despite the, you know, the science. Uh, and we have, um, you know, we have the, the variants coming at us. Um, that's, that's pretty risky business. And all of this extends the life of the COVID epidemic. All of this puts other people at risk. Um, and on the other hand, we completely politicize the notion of free voting. And as I said, uh, I, don't, I don't think that HR1 is going to pass. All indications are it's not going to pass. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, complex question, multiple parts, but I think uh, basically, uh, you know, when I was watching those, the, the kids encouraged by their parents and lawmakers to burn masks in Idaho on the steps of the Capitol, that just sort of encapsulates the problem that we're dealing with right now. We need to reach the youth, and you would think that the youth would probably, they'll catch up. You know, your parents tell you to do whatever you're supposed to do, and you, you do it, but after a while, kids pretty much figure out the internet on their own and they're able to bypass everything in schools, I think, even to, to get onto stuff or their friends will have it. So they'll hopefully educate themselves, but that's a long time before they get to the point of voting. Um, and even then, have, will they have lost entire faith in the system when, when they can see these egregious examples of, what was it, no water given to people in the voting lines or, or what was the thing we heard yesterday? Um, yeah, that's one of those bills. It's one of those yeah. bills. Yeah, the, the gerrymandering, the uh, the lack of, a, of a, you know universal voting. I mean, based on just driver's licenses and social security cards and just those sorts of things. There's so much we can do to make this process easier, better, more secure. Um, and there's people who have a vested interest in that not happening. And we need to be cognizant of that. And like we were you know, talking yesterday after the, the show, it seems like, uh, I don't know where the Supreme Court's going to go on this, but they seem to defer to um, the legislatures of various states in their rulings. Uh, they, did, they were reticent to, to intervene as jurists and said, this is up to them. Now, given when push came to shove, they would probably um, take a stand. But I don't know. They, that hasn't really been tested yet. And so it is happening state by state. 
crazy law by crazy law. And it depends on what state you live in. Do you live in a state that values uh, democracy and participation and uh, robust civic engagement or not? And that's what it comes down to. And that's probably where it's going to come down to yeah, uh, well, at you, the end of the day. You know, uh, Tim, you know, before the election, the Republicans were in lockstep under Trump. And one would have thought that after the election that that, that would have somehow been modified. But in large part, the Republicans are still in lockstep. They were in lockstep to turn the election over. Uh, they voted, you know, right down to the person, mostly with, within a few, a few exceptions only, um, to uh, turn it over uh, in in the in the historic se uh, session, right after the January sixth insurrection. They still voted to turn it over. Um, and now they're voting on everything in a lockstep, uh, nearly every Republican. And you can bet your bippy uh, that they'll vote against HR1, they'll vote against anything that Biden puts on. What, what holds them together? What is it? Because it, it, you know, from just an observer point of view, I wish I could say, I wish we could all say there's a reason for this. Um, but what, what is the reason? What holds them together? And they, sign, they show no sign of relenting. Well, Jay, sometimes you flummox me. I use terms like you bet your bippy, which is a Rona <laughs> Martin's laughing uh, line from 1969. So um, <laughs> great question was filled with all sorts of intrigue. Um, <laughs> the, short, the short answer, Jay, is Donald Trump still rules the GOP. I mean, sorry, that's the short answer. And they are frightened of him, fearfully. I mean, mortally. <laughs> And frightened of death with this guy. I can't, I can't and, understand uh, it. Yeah. Until that death grip is released, uh, you won't see them uh, break ranks. You won't see it. Now, I, I just wanted to take one um, comment about the HR one and your your position about it's not likely it will pass because you need sixty senators. But what if HR one had a huge financial component to it, which is to say federal dollars for each state to ensure that some of these proposals in HR one <clears throat> are actually followed? And then there's a there's a price tag, a dollar budget assigned to HR1. Could you not use then the reconciliation process, the one left, the one Mulligan left, and use it and then try to get your passage through 51 votes, including the vice president? Oh, no, forget the parliamentarian. The parliamentarian's got to find, a, you know, an intrinsic connection between. Well, I don't know any budget. parliamentarian that runs this country. It's called, uh, <laughs> called the president of the United States that runs this country. <laughs> Okay, well, I hope you can be, you know, somewhat um, optimistic about that. Um, but so far, McConnell has said, Tim, he said he's going to fight it tooth and nail. And so what, what makes McConnell do that? Forget about uh, Trump. What makes McConnell do that? Is it loyalty? Has he found some sort of renewed loyalty to Trump? Does he believe it's okay to mount an insurrection, incite an insurrection, and he'll still love you anyway? Uh, what is it that he, that he that motivates the man? Well, he, like Lindsey Graham, is two-faced. On Monday, he'll say one thing, and on Wednesday, he'll say complete 180-degree difference. So who knows what's going to be transpire between now and uh, HR comes up to the floor. Uh, expect him to, to change its position like the wind. That's all you can depend on. Um, does he have a new founded agreement with Donald Trump? Probably somewhere in there, deep under the, under the covers that we haven't seen. But the bottom line is, um, if you put your mind to it, it can still work. You can get this thing passed. And I agree with your comments yesterday. Uh, this election in 2022 is going to be paramount. And if it's not addressed now, it's going to be a big mess in 2022. So you might as well, you might as well put in the safeguards to uh, keep the rule, of, uh, the rule of law, which your friend likes to adhere to, uh, about election security and, and election fairness. You know, okay. you know Stephanie. Uh, yes, Winston. I, I just, you, when you ask that question about Tim, why do these guys do this? It's, I've been thinking about that too a lot. Like what, what's Lindsey Graham when he's, he's done with the Donald, but well, that was, that was, you know, whatever it was. And now he's back to, you know, licking the boots. And so I figure it's a, it's a compromise. It's a, a, a compound of compromat, whatever they got. It's a, comprom it's a compound of, um, of Stockholm syndrome. It's a compound of, it seems like almost like battered wife syndrome, really, 
um, there, there's that fear and terror that maybe, you know, he'll go after the children or the dogs or, or maybe he led with the dogs already. And so there's all of this mixed in. And then there may be some tiny underlying bit of, well, he got our, our whatever passed, our judges in and our tax cuts in there. So it's this sort of unholy mix uh, that's, that's sticking it all together with probably a sincere trip to their churches, synagogues, and, and, and any other places that they worship, that Donald Trump's influence will, will wane uh, significantly over time. I don't see it happening. And it, it'll be interesting to see if the Josh Hawley's of the world, which I saw he and uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene spiked in um, uh, donations right after uh, all of the, you know, when it came, all the, the mess was happening. Like their, their websites were were spiking with donations because people were like, you're my true hero. So they may be, it'd be interesting to see that they become the natural heirs to the Donald Trump throne. He just sort of sits back mm -hmm. and um, enjoys yeah. His base retirement. is gonna follow someone. So one, someone. one of the question is, you know, it, it, it's been suggested and, and it seems clear to me, but I wanna know your thoughts. Uh, and, and if you do think about their motivations for these people, uh, you have to think about racism. You have to think about whether, you know, there's a fundamental um, gross racism that motivates them. In the voting suppression area, I, I can't imagine what else it is. They want to have a white country. They don't want blacks or browns. And, and uh, although they may not admit it, um, this has got to be a big part of their thinking and their motivation, whatever happens. What do you think? Well, what, it, it could be part of it. Because I think you've raised just profound issues in these questions and all of the statements that Winston and Tim have made are really interesting. But I think that, you know, we can't dismiss the role of uh, power and money, okay? And also the insight that we have, and hopefully all fe our fellow citizens have, that these guys, the um, mansion and the, the Lindsey Graham and, uh, and, and Mc, Mc, uh, Mitch, they um, are playing both sides of the coin here. I mean, so it is just so clear. They're, they're on both of the tracks so that they'll be sure to be in the front of the train. Uh, so they're just waiting to see how it's all gonna break and they will have their paths laid out because they're interested in the power. And then all of them can't be interested in the big power like Mitch and Manchin and these people who are trying to play both sides so that when it does get clear on who is the heavyweight and where it's going and where the people are gonna follow, that that's where the money is. And so that's what they need to do, which is to get in a position to be in the best place. And, and I mean, it is scoundrel. It is, it is that, that scoundrel word that the founders did use. I mean, these people have no, as you ask, what are these values and what, what are these principles that these people are going by? Well, hey, let's just admit there aren't many. Well, you say money, but are, are you saying, Stephanie, this is an important question. Are you saying they're, they're, that self-aggrandizement is what motivates them? Because there is a lot of money. Think about it. There's a lot of money. Trump you know, is pocketing a lot of money. McConnell is pocketing a lot of money. Is it is it that is that why they do this for money in their own pockets? I don't know that some of them have certainly have that motivation or incentive, but the other part of it is anarchy. I mean, this is just so interesting as to what was like going on towards the end of the 19th century, the, the 19th century, and uh, there's anarchists all over the place, throwing bombs, attacking the empress. Why know? would you why would you seek chaos? because you enjoy putting on your horned hat and painting yourself up and being a cowboy. Don't you worry about chaos eating you? Pardon me? Don't you worry about chaos coming back on you and destroying your quality of life? Chaos doesn't really help anybody. Yeah, well, if I'm doing chaos, I'm doing it to meet my need for chaos, which really doesn't care about my what my life is. My life is probably not what I want it to be. And I probably don't even know about having money and making my, a life, you know, that would be satisfying to me or make me happier than going for chaos. So all of these people are motivated out of these base things uh, a lot of the time. And I think that that may be the case here. These people enjoy doing that. I mean, they, they left good jobs to go do, do that. Let me and throw this at you. Money is a way to get power especially in these United States now in the 21st century. If you want an election, you want to win an election, you really must have money 
And you can effectively, using media and TV and what, you can buy votes. You can calculate how much it costs to buy a vote. And of course, there's all these you know, backroom things, but that also costs money. So money may be, it's nice in your pockets, but it is actually a pathway to power. Okay, That's and, right. And I don't fully understand power, I must say, but it seems to me that that is the single biggest thing because with power, you can do all kinds of things you never thought of before. You know, yep. you, you, you just know that you have a blank check. It's a blank check on, on, on power over the people. It's I, just a thought. Yeah. It also is attractive to all of the people who are a disenfranchised or, uh, or think they are or want, want more money. But um, the other part of it um, has to do with we have to learn how to use the media and the internet. And I just want to point out two things that have happened, one of which is the um, let's defund the police. Now, that, that went out as a meme. And this never stopped and will never stop and we'll never quit hearing about it. And I'll bet there's not 1% of people in this country that want no police forces in their city as the Democrats are being accused of not wanting any police around then what happens, that's anarchy. But uh, there's that. So we need to know better how to handle these me the messaging and, uh, and you need money you know, to influence and set up situations. And the other example of that that I see lately is that um, the asking somebody about the color of their skin or what kind of baby are you having? Are you, how about a red? Are you more likely to have a redhead? I mean, at, at saying those kinds of things that then flash off around the internet, just like defund the police and other memes that have been thrown out. Um, and, and it goes haywire. And the meaningfulness of it is just completely um, constructed by every human brain that gets it. It's not driven by an intention to get a message out. So we've got a lot of work. To we've do. got a lot of work to do. But Tim, you know, I, I wonder, you know, it really does sound like a, a kind of civil war, all pointed to 2022 and 2024. Actually, that rhymes. And, and uh, you know, the Republicans are making the war. I think the Democrats are playing it straight, mostly. Uh, Biden is certainly playing it straight. He's doing what he can within his powers uh, to advance initiatives that help the people, all very faithful and good faith. You know, but if you're trying, if you're seeking chaos, that's not good faith. It can't be good faith. And, you know, the, the war the Republicans are waging, in, in, you know, uh, with um, trying to undo the, the government's uh, efforts to, um, you know, to, to, uh, to beat the COVID, and uh, of course, the voting rights issue is just, is just tragic. But meanwhile, we can't lose sight of the fact that they are doing this, all of this, um, to gain power in 2022 and 2024, so that they can have their blank check on power in the Congress and do whatever they want and, and um, you know, beat, beat the Democrats on everything. That's why I think another leg of that war is they try to, um, you know, uh, decredibilize Joe Biden criticize everything he does. Never, ever vote for anything that the Democrats put into Congress. Never, ever. I think we're going to see that going forward. And my question to you is not easy. Is, is that sustainable? Can we have a government that will operate that way uh, on sort of a gamesmanship approach? Oh, that's a tough question, Jay. Um, I think we've seen shades of this for the last 150 years. And I go back to the comments uh, that Stephanie made yesterday. Was, we haven't progressed from the days of reconstruction. At this current time, the GOP knows the demographics are not behind them. They cannot win a vote based on white male votes only. They can't win these elections. So their only alternative is to restrict those who can vote. And that's why they're going to dig in their heels on these 200 and some odd, uh, 253 new cockamamie uh, rules and laws that are going on across 43 states. They know they cannot win. And my proof, my evidence, Georgia. Georgia is a classic example where they thought that uh, a red state would stay red, but uh, through uh, aggressive door-to-door uh, -door knocking and, and convincing voters that felt hopeless to vote in, the, to vote in the past, that their vote could count, would count, and did count. 
And that is why the Republicans will fight these things to the end, because they know they won't work and they won't win in 2022 and 2024. And so it's up to the Democrats and it's up to independents to say, we want fair election. And, and if your platform doesn't win the day in ideas and policies, then change your platform. Be competitive. Win elections based on ideas and policies, not on racism and cutting people out of the vote. Uh, you know, Winston, one of the things uh, that we really need to talk about is what's in the pipeline from Joe Biden. Uh, we know he's got, um, you know, HR1. We know he's got immigration. We know he's got infrastructure. We know he's got gun control. What did I miss? Um, there's a bunch of things, four or five things. He's named them. Um, but at the end of the day, they all require legislation. He can do a lot. I shouldn't say a lot. He can do some things by proclamation. But at the end of the day, he's going to need to get legislation through the Congress. Um, I fear that he won't be able to do that. But the Republicans are going to be in lockstep. Um, and they can and will do everything they possibly can uh, to stop his initiatives, even though the Democrats have a majority of both House and Senate. What are your thoughts about that? They don't have a majority with our, our vice president. Uh, who can cast a tie-breaking vote depending on if Joe Manchin goes along with things. You know, you mean the filibuster and the uh, right? anything. Yeah, I mean he's he's he like I said yesterday, um a bridge for everyone in West Virginia, golden toilets and um you know a, a fatted yeah. hog. But I uh it, it, yeah the reality is as I said yesterday we have the most competent sane um respected respectful man in office a person in office who's most qualified to ever hold this position. Maybe folks will come around. I'm not not overly hopeful, but you know, we have to also think, why do these people, why do people, why did they vote? Half the nation, why is it voting in the other way? Is it racism or, or is it just fear? Is it fear of change? Is it fear that their America that they grew up with, isn't that America anymore? And having to look at, look at that in the mirror when you go to the mall or Safeway or wherever it is you're going, and you've been used to a certain system and a certain everything, and now it's just not that way anymore. And someone's telling you who to hate and, and that who's to blame. And that's really easy to do. But the promise of this nation is that everybody gets lifted up. And rights have never been given to any group. Oh, without okay, but in the mandate. next two years... I suggest to you that Joe Biden's initiatives like immigration, infrastructure, gun control, you name it, they're not going to go anywhere. He needs to focus on then, then pork getting out because that's what people will respond to. Don't go after the guns. Send, I guess, send a Bible to everybody's house with along with uh, the check. You know, he's not signing the checks. Maybe he could sign the Bible courtesy of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I, I mean, you know, just letting people know. Please. It's okay, folks. We've got to, you know, I look like you, even if I'm saying something a little bit different, our country holds promise for everybody. And we got to raise everybody up in this nation because that's what we do as Americans. And so if he can appeal to our base root identity as a place of promise that this nation has been and has always been, right? We had a, we had a really hard four years of bruising and battering of our ideals, but we can come back to them. And he's got a lot of work to do. He's only been in two months. We got to give him a break. Oh, things two move from fast, now. and the, the, the news cycle moves so quickly; it's blinding. Stephanie, your it point does. earlier about um, you know a lot of work to do, and, and we have to train people, generations to come, you know, and understanding what's going on. But you know, I had a conversation with one of my walking buddies this morning, and she said, you know, I'm not I'm not watching television so much anymore. Um, you know, I don't like the I don't like the commercials that much. There's not that much news. You know, in the day of Trump, it was all raw meat. It was outrage after outrage, um, and you know, you were glued to the tube to find out what crazy thing he had done that day. Uh, he certainly knew how to keep your eyes glued to the tube. Now I think we have this kind of creeping complacency. He's not there. You don't care as much. You're offended by the commercials. You're, you know, you're not as excited as you were. And, and I'm, I'm concerned um, that over the next couple of years, people are going to drift off. They're not going to be interested so much in these elections. They're not going to be responding to all the email, you know, asking you for $5. Uh, 
um, and 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 we we won't find the same level of civic engagement without him uh, that we have with him. And by the time we get to 2022, the uh, the guys who are the Republicans who are mounting the civil war will have a, an advantage for that. What do you think? Well, I think uh, you're you're certainly on to something there, and uh, I believe that. Uh, well, there there are a couple of things. You, you're you're bringing up the Donald in a way that it is important because he's a leader. Okay, so they see him as a leader, and what we don't have anywhere else is a leader, except we have Biden, who is a leader in a, in a quiet mode, in a new mode, in a mode that reflects our values. Now, whether that can uh, be, um, be, you know, uh, loud enough, a leadership model for all of these, for all of us to, to galvanize towards that way of leadership that we've all been now we, uh, we've had so much of it and been so annoyed with it, but now it's gone and now we miss it. But anyway, so we need a leader. That's that very perverse. Yeah. Oh, is it? It's not McConnell. It's not Lindsey Graham. It's not Joe Manchin. So where's this leader going to come from? So we need to find him. And it doesn't look like it might, it would be the senator from Utah. But the other, the other point I want to make is we've got to get to the people. And all of you have been saying this. We have to get to the people because that's what the Republicans have done. Have gotten laid into the, down into the states and gotten all that fixed their way. Well, we have to keep on getting to the people, which they're trying to get in the way of with the, all this voting. And, and, uh, depression, oppression, and that we have somebody like a Stacey Abrams, okay, who's working this side, of it. and we've got to, we've got to really support her and praise her and um, make sure she stays on that work, not just in Georgia, but I think she even says she understands that this has to be done in all those other states that are having this problem. So we've got to get direct because if we get to the people, okay, which is what this country is about is the people and um, they actually have the right to vote which is what the republicans don't want because they will not vote for this junk we have to deal with so um we do have to you know find our leader respect our leader you know make sure our leader is well understood and known and then we've got to get the people to attend to it so i think stacy's one key yeah well you know maybe maybe we're into another another wave of activism i mean like stacy good example and i and i wonder you know tim what do you think we need to do i say we i mean people who are uh, civically engaged people who care about the future of the country who see these events as affecting the future of the country who believe you know with me that you know it's going to affect us all nobody is exempt from these events what do we do? And it's the, the temptation to turn our backs on it is so great. To go complacent. What do we do? Do we give money? Do we write no. op-ed pieces? What do we do? Well, money, the love of money is the root of all evil, which you were getting that to earlier in the discussion here. And so, no, more money is not necessarily the way to win uh, the elections on a long-term permanent basis. I go back to what Obama tried to do or wanted to do, unsuccessful, uh, is reverse Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision to get real big money out of our election cycle. And it, I, I think Republicans, the voter, the common, the common folk, both on both sides of the, uh, the, the divide, the political divide, will, will believe in that. They know that money is corrupting our political system. And so I think somewhere in Joe Biden's agenda, uh, reversing Citizens United might be well, well served and, and actually benefit both sides of our political system. And I, I think that maybe um, voters would support that. Yeah, well, that would be interesting. But you know, you know, it's a knee jerk matter that Mitch McConnell will oppose anything that, that uh, changes the status quo for of course. Him. Yes, I know That's that a problem. You know. But you know, your point, I think, is well taken in the sense that there are a couple of little things that could have big effect. Reversing Citizen United, which which was so damaging, destructive to the country, and you knew at the time it was it was handed down this would happen, and it has happened right on cue. That case is absolutely corrosive. The other thing is the filibuster. It's it's become clear that the filibuster and the cloture rule they are destroying the power of Congress. They destroy Congress has destroyed itself with those rules. We got to stop that sort of thing. 
and also the rule that lets any senator re, you know, require the reading of every bill. That's game playing. We do not have time for that. You know, I, I mentioned the other day that I think the one failure of the Constitution that's worth discussing is the fact that it, it makes it so hard to amend. We should be amending it to amend it with the times, the times they are changing. So, you know, a little thing like knocking off the cloture rule would have a huge effect on public policy and the viability of Congress. Uh, a little thing like the Supreme Court knocking off um, Citizens United would have a huge effect on our country. We have to shed those things. A little change makes for a, a big result. Anyway, let's let's do uh, let's do closing statements, okay? Winston, take two hours. Go ahead, go for it. <laughs> well, Jay, uh, Citizens United disaster for my nation, our nation. I think it's probably too late for that. Everyone in office has already been, um, I don't want to say paid for. I just I say the money in politics is so overwhelming right now. How do you take it out? I, just in those Georgia races, the two Senate races alone, it was, it was a, a, almost a half a billion dollars, wasn't it, that was poured into those races just for those two seats. These are extremely consequential um, races. Money's gonna, it's not you know, going half anywhere. a billion dollars could buy a lot of clean water uh, in Michigan. Could, and, but and Louisiana. you know what, it's, it's not where it's at. And I think another point that I, I just wanted to bring up is that for us, what can we do? You said, what can we do? We can have a, a show on Think Tech. We can have our own YouTube show. We can, um, we can go to our neighborhood board meetings. We can, we can write to our senator. We can speak up when we feel like it. And we can donate to causes and organizations that are promoting the values that we want to see enacted because we do speak louder uh, with organizations. And, and we can stay informed. We can read. We can read a variety of publications. We can keep our minds open. We can keep our hearts open. And we need to view our, our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, our family members. They're not enemies. And we don't need to have a civil war. We need to have a civil discussion and uh, realize that they are compatriots who um, feel the same way that we do, that we've, all, we've both been bamboozled from the other side and we're brainwashed. And we need to get past that and find the ways to get past that and have goodwill on both sides. And it's gonna take an enormous effort because we are so manipulated by media, by social media, by, um, by bombastic leaders, by Russia, by people that, you know, whatever it is. And so, but I remain, uh, we have Joe Biden as our president right now. That took a Herculean effort, but if we can do that, that meant that we reached enough hearts and minds for people to do the same right thing. And now we just have to continue that, but extend the dialogue um, on a personal level and how we, um, how we talk, how we think how we want the, be, the world to be, be the change you wish to see, right? I mean, uh, and today is, at, and you mentioned Canasta yesterday. For the, for the youngins out there, Google Canasta, there's all kinds of different forms depending on which Latin America country version you like. It's something we need to bring back and we need to bring it back with all the people <laughs> who we have defriended or unfriended over the last few years and just sit around over Canasta and, and play some. <laughs> Canasta may be the savior of all of it, where we just sit around the table. Stephanie, you're like, much too young for this discussion. I loved you, Canasta. You, would, you I wouldn't even remember it. Stephanie about Canasta. Um, so, <laughs> Stephanie, what are your thoughts on this? Well, this discussion has been most provocative, and it's made me realize that um, at Stacey Abrams, a point made to go um, and, and talk to the people and bring the people into the conversation of this nation, certainly into voting. But turning around all of the strategies and the way we act in media and uh, you know doing things that promote the message and don't get the message into turned into a weapon in the hands of other people. Uh, but the other side of it you bring up too is with uh, Citizens United. Now, that's the other pocketbook. Okay, so you got the gov with its money. And I think there's some controversy about who's got the most money, the 
gov or corporations but we need also to use that in another way so so, so maybe joe biden can is is going to work on this but how do you turn that around so that the united uh the P citizens united donors um, are brought to accountability and are brought to attend to what it is they're doing and how can we press on them to do it differently. So I, we've got a lot of really big strategizing the Democrats do have need of doing that. The Republicans have been doing that for 20, 30 years, which is why they've got the states all tied up in knots. So now it's time to get on with um, our, our wonderful leaders already, like Stacey Abrams and, and whoever um, can uh, get uh, the corporations to help out in in ways as big as what the party can do on its own. I mean, that's why we lot we, we got the Georgia folks, right? The two senators. I mean, that didn't just come from people putting money in. Well, Somebody you, else put into that. You used to say all okay. politics is local, um, you know, and, and maybe that's so. I mean, if I stand on this on the on the street corner or the roadway at seven o'clock in the morning, I talk to my neighbor, I tell my neighbor what I think about these things. And she tells me that's that's tonic. And that's all I can do. I mean, aside from, you know, but think it's not tank, that's all I can do. But you know, I saw something in, in the various news, newsletters that I get yesterday. It's interesting. I said, do you want to participate in a phone bank to talk to the people in some southern state? Let's talk to them. And all you got to do is, you know, sign up, and we'll, we'll automatically connect you. And it'll be, you know, sort of an automated phone phone call, and you can just share your thoughts with them. And I, this is, you know, this I think may be coming. This sort of thing, to have collective thought among various regions, where I don't I don't limit myself to the, the woman on the street corner at seven o'clock in the morning who basically agrees, mm -hmm. uh, but the people that don't agree, the, the people that Winston talks with in the south, you know, that'd be different. Anyway, okay, we're almost we are out of time for sure. Tim, um, give us some profundity, will you? I want my two hours like Winston. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I know. Okay, real quick. Reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. You Winston. may not use the word canasta. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sit down with Joe Manson. Work out something that calls filibuster reform. Don't, you know, in life, it's not yes or no, black and white. You know, there's gray area. That's what the art of compromise is. Sit down with Joe Manchin, work out how filibuster can be reformed and pass it. And let's get this government moving. I don't care what government, GOP or Democrat, uh, let's get this government moving in the right direction that serves all the American people. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Tim Apicella, Stephanie Stahl, uh, Dalton, Winston Welsh. Thank you so much. You guys are great. Aloha till next time.